6 o'clock. Um, do you know of anybody else that's coming from any of y'all's teams? No. No clue. Probably not. Okay. Well, we're going to get started either way. If people trickle in, they can come in. Um, I've got a lot of stuff to cover in two hours. So we're going to get to it. Let me dim the lights. Okay. Can you guys see that okay? Okay. Can you tell it's pink? No. No? It's supposed to be pink. It's like happy baby color. No? Okay. Okay. So for those of you guys who don't know me, my name's Emma. I'm a fourth year. Um, and as I was telling some of the folks earlier, I made these PowerPoints um, as a study strategy for me for my step two. So I went back through all my notes, all my little books and study aids that I used when I was in uh, third year clerkships and kind of compiled everything together in this PowerPoint. It's in a question and answer format. So, you know, the question will be up first and then we'll see if anyone has an idea of what the answer is. Um, you know, I'll click the button and then the answer will come up. So very low stress. I'm not going to like go down the row and pimp anybody. But, you know, if you participate, yell out answers when you know them, I think you'll get more out of it uh, and it'll be less awkward for me. So your participation will be appreciated. Um, and I'm going to go straight through for two hours. So please don't think you're going to offend me if you have to get up, use the potty, get a drink, leave if it sucks. All of that's fine. So um, any questions before we get started? I tried to hit the high yield stuff. All right, so we'll start with babies. We've got a newborn. Pulse is 130. The baby is acrocyanotic, grimaces to stimulation, moves all extremities, and is crying. Apgar score for our new little friend. So pulse of 130. Does the baby get full points for a pulse? Yes, because it's over 100, so two points for that. What about for color? Yeah, so we lose a point for color, only one if it's acrocyanotic, and that's blue on the hands and feet. Grimaces to stimulation, that's minus one. To get full points for withdraw, they've got to withdraw from the stimulation. So grimace is going to be minus one. Moving all extremities, can't get much better than that, that's two. And crying, that's two for respiration. So this baby's got an APGAR score of eight. So what does the APGAR tell you? They almost always try to integrate a question on this somewhere. So what does it tell you? Yeah, so for Harlingen, what they're saying is it gives us a picture of what the baby looks like at birth. So, and specifically, the one-minute APGAR score tells us how the baby tolerated labor, how if it was distressed, if it was okay. Uh, and then the five-minute tells us how it, the baby is responding to the stimulation and their resuscitative effects. Uh, what's more important and what's commonly a tricky wrong answer on the shelf is what the APGAR doesn't tell you. And what's that? Yeah, so it's not predictive. It does not tell you if this baby's going to be brain damaged, have ADD, have mental retardation, doesn't tell us any of that. And it also should never direct resuscitative or direct treatment. So it's just a snapshot in time. Tells us what the baby's doing at that one minute and the five minutes. So it does not guide therapy. Your clinical reasoning does, and it does not predict outcome for the child. So those are important things to remember about the APGAR score. You want to make sure you got that question right. You can miss some other ones, but we'll get the APGAR one right. Okay, so now we're examining these precious little babies in the newborn nursery, and we're assessing a moral reflex on a large for gestational age infant. The right arm remains extended and is medially rotated. So what's wrong with this kiddo? So you can do it, right? Medially rotated, kind of like somebody wants a tip of some kind. Clumpy, clumpy is, clumpy is the claw, so this is herbs. This is herbs palsy. Um, and they may go all step one on you and ask you about the nerve roots. Probably not, though. I think if you can pick it out in a clinical vignette, you'll be okay there. Um, the key for treatment is there is neurosurgery that's available to fix it. If it doesn't go away on its own by three to six months, you refer for surgery. They can surgically correct these now. So we've got another large for gestational age baby, and we're palpating the clavicles, and we feel crepitus and discontinuity. So what is that a sign of? Clavicle fracture, very good. And more importantly, they're going to ask you what we need to do for this baby. Very good. So very different from adult medicine. Uh, usually the child, the newborn's bones are much more apt to remodeling, so they're going to form a callus, no treatment's needed. 
Um, I've read some places that you can use a figure of eight splint like you do in adults, but not necessary. Okay, so what about my first little kiddo with the funny shaped head? And if you palpated the baby, you might feel edema that crosses suture lines. Cap it. Very good. So edema, it's pitting. You know, like the people who have pitting edema on the legs? These babies, you can leave a thumbprint in their head. So that's edema, it's spongy, and it does cross the suture lines. That's cap it. And what about my other little friend? Um, well, if they, maybe the picture's not the greatest, but if the description tells you it's fluctuant when you palpate it, and the fluctuance doesn't cross suture lines. Yeah, so this kiddo just happens to have them bilaterally. I couldn't find a picture where it was just one. But you see down the middle of the suture, it's not crossing, crossing the suture lines. He's got them on both sides. So, so just remember that. Whether or not the swelling crosses the suture lines is a big distinguishing factor between caput and cephalohematoma. All right. Cute baby rashes. So this first one, it might be described as a blue slate gray macule on the back or thigh. Good. And what are they made of? If you biopsied that little lesion, melanocytes. Very good. Two extra points for you. Just kidding. I can't do that. So they're arrested melanocytes. That's what the, what the Mongolian spots are made up of. Okay. So our second little baby has pale pink vascular macules on the nuchal area or the face. Um, the facial ones tend to disappear, but the ones on the neck can persist into adolescence, and these get like more red if the kid gets angry or does sports. Salmon patch. This is the nevus simplex. So hemangiomas are more sharply demarcated um, and redder and don't tend to be on the face and nuchal area. So the location should be a helpful factor in determining nevus simplex. So face, nuchal area, the facial, facial ones will regress, the nuchal ones will stick around. Okay, so our little baby with the hat over his eyes. Um, you can't really see them very well in this picture, but they'd be described as firm white papules. You'll see them on day of life number one, and they're filled with keratin milia. Good. So what do you not want to confuse this with? Other little bumpy things on a baby's face. Neonatal acne. So what's the difference? Size, not so much. Um, timing. Timing. You won't see neonatal acne on day of life one. It typically doesn't show up until week of life, maybe one or two. So we'll see that in a little bit. So this third baby, or the fourth baby, the lesions, I don't know if you can see them, they might be described as firm yellow-white pustules and papules on an erythematous base. You might see them on day of life number two. Very good, erythema toxicum. And what are they filled with if you took a biopsy? Eosinophils, very good, very good. Okay, so in baby number five, here's your bright red, sharply demarcated, raised lesion usually occurs in the first couple months. Yeah, here's your hemangioma. So they're typically smaller and they're raised, so they're palpable. The nevus simplex or the salmon patch, typically you can't run your fingers across it. Um, and here, baby number six, this might happen on week of life one or two, erythematous papules, these are the neonatal acne. So I think time is the biggest clue there in determining between milia and neonatal acne. Um, and neonatal acne, just like in adolescence, um, or if you're unfortunate like me in uh, your 20s, it's due to what? What causes acne in these babies? Yeah, hormones. Same, same reason. Same reason it occurs in adolescence. So it's just the maternal androgens that are high circulating levels in the baby. All right. So what about this kiddo? What's on his face? Nevis sebaceous, seborrhea is the next one. So nevis sebaceous, you might see it described as an area of alopecia. So you see there's not hair growing in that lesion. Um, and the skin is orange colored and it's nodular if you run your, fi your fingers across it. And what do we do with these lesions? Are they just going to piece out on their own like some of our other cutaneous? 
Very good. So we remove these before adolescence because they do have a risk of malignant degeneration. So nevus sebaceous, this nodular orange lesion needs to be removed. Here's our seborrheic dermatitis, um, a common name for this. It's on the baby's head, like a little cap, cradle cap. Um, and what do we do for this? Antifungal or a mild shampoo. Usually it's pretty easy to get rid of. Um, you treat it similarly in adults. It's a bigger deal in adults because it usually only happens in adults with HIV or AIDS. But in babies, it just happens in babies. So just gently cleanse it. Sometimes they'll tell you to put the shampoo on a toothbrush, a soft toothbrush, and scrub the lesions. Okay. So any questions about skin findings you might see on a neonate? They might show you a picture. More often, though, they're going to describe it. So when you're studying, keep in mind those keywords that kind of distinguish each of the lesions from each other. Any questions? Fair enough. All right, so on the neonatal screen, it varies slightly between states, but there are two disorders that are always screened for, and it's important to catch them early um, because it can lead to disastrous consequences if the baby's allowed to breastfeed. Galactosemia and PKU. Very good. So PKU, um, you remember this from biochemistry or from step one, it's a deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase. And the symptoms, you don't see them right away. In galactosemia, you see the symptoms right from birth because galactose can cross the placenta and starts to affect the baby when it's still in utero. PKU, we don't see the symptoms until a couple months later. Uh, and you start seeing delay in development, signs of mental retardation, and then there are those classic signs with the white hair, the kind of musty, mousy odor that they often describe in, in questions. In galactosemia, it's a problem with this G1P uridyl transferase that you probably remember from biochemistry, uh, and it, it uh, causes this precursor, G1P, to accumulate and cause damage to a lot of the different organs in the body. Uh, and these cataracts, um, jaundice, seizures, all of these findings are found right from birth because galactose can cross the placenta. So these are a big deal because there's obviously lactose in breast milk and there's also phenylalanine. Okay. So a yellow baby. Lots of questions on your test, at least two probably, about neonatal jaundice just because there are so many different reasons um, and treatment is important. So. If we have a yellow baby that is three days old, the billy is 10, and the direct fraction or the direct bilirubin is only 0 0.5, um, and the baby's pretty much okay eating and pooping well, what would we suspect to be the mechanism or the problem? Yeah, so this is just physiologic jaundice. It's physiologic if it's gone by day five.